Hello, Dr. Dent, for the kind introduction. Uh, welcome to the applicants, and a very good morning for the rest of you. So let's start with some breast cancer facts. And my only disclosure for this talk is it's not that I love breast surgery. I just hate breast cancer. And here's the reason why. Um, if there's 50 women in this room today, five or six of us over our lifetime are going to get breast cancer, and one, of her, one or two of us may even die off it. Um, and if you're a newly diagnosed patient with breast cancer, you're thrown into this world of confusing terminology. Uh, it's a completely new language you're trying to learn. And these are not common terms that people are discussing at the breakfast table every day. So um, patients can get very overwhelmed. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is radiation. And you may ask, why do we as surgeons care about radiation? Radiation, because, you know, there's radiation oncology for that. So the truth is we're often the first... Um, physicians meeting these patients with newly diagnosed breast cancer. Uh, the only person they've seen before that is the breast radiologist who tells them, okay, now you have a path that shows breast cancer. So you, are, you should be in a position to counsel patients about what their multidisciplinary plan of treatment uh, is going to be and um, what they should expect uh, during the treatment to come. Often the radiation facility will determine where the patient chooses to get their breast care because, you know, a surgeon armed with a cautery and a knife is going to be able to do most everything in breast surgery. It's not that complicated. And you can have the surgeon go anywhere and operate. Um, same thing about chemotherapy molecules. They can be really shipped to any corner of the world, but the radiation facility is fixed, and that's going to determine where the patient would go. That's going to determine their quality of care. The radiation decisions are going to affect your surgical decisions, so you're not going to do a lumpectomy if you think the patient's not going to get radiation. It's going to affect your outcomes, both oncologic as well as cosmetic. And as we move along, and, you know, there's newer um, avenues out there about intraoperative radiation brachytherapy, you may be called upon to assist in some of these procedures, and it's good to be familiar uh, with the recent data on that. So this is how my... Um, treatment counseling sheet looks like for a patient with newly diagnosed early breast cancer. And this is something I often scribble on a piece of paper for them. But as a surgeon, the, the thing I tell them is, you know, there's really only three ways doctors know how to treat cancer. I mean, any kind of cancer. It's surgery, radiation, and medicine, medical treatment, which in breast cancer includes hormone therapy and chemotherapy. And as far as surgery is concerned, the first decision you're going to help the patient make is going to be <clears throat> the choice between a lumpectomy and a mastectomy. And the decision for a lumpectomy is going to be tied in with the decision to perform most often whole breast radiation. And if you're going to do a mastectomy and if you anticipate uh, radiation, that's going to affect your decisions about reconstruction. And um, that's true of most places that we would delay reconstruction if we can, although that's not everybody's opinion. So we're going to talk about the role for radiation in breast cancer and the headings of uh, the role for whole breast radiation with breast conservation, post-mastectomy radiation, and then radiation for local regional disease and metastatic breast cancer. So we saw this slide last week when Dr. Mueller talked about discovery of x-rays, and she gave us a very interesting anecdote. But the truth is when Ranjan discovered x-rays, he laid the foundation not only for, a field, for the field of diagnostic radiology, but also for a new field to come in radiation oncology. And then shortly after the discovery of x-rays came the discovery of certain elements with spontaneous radioactivity. So Henry Becquerel discovered uranium, the Curies discovered um, radium, and um, the Curie couple was kind of cute. You know, in their eight years of marriage, they got one Nobel Prize in physics together. They had two daughters. One of the daughters and their son-in-law won again a Nobel Prize in physics together. After Pierre Curie died, Marie Curie won another Nobel Prize, this time in chemistry. So I think the Nobel Prize should just be called the Curie Prize. But, um, but this was important because with spontaneous radioactivity, now you had sources that came in over the years, the cobalt-60 that we use in external beam radiation, the iridium that we use in partial breast radiation all came out for that. But the first person to actually treat breast cancer with radiation or attempt to treat breast cancer with radiation was someone called Emil Grubb. And which of you thinks he might have been a surgeon? Who thinks he may have been a medical student? Maybe. See, stand up for your, stand up for your people. Well, it was a medical student. So... Um, Emil Grubb was a Chicago medical student who was trying to pay for medical school working in a factory making x-ray tubes, and he noticed that the factory workers' hands were all exfoliated, and he theorized that maybe uh, the radiation is causing cell death. And if that were true, maybe we could use this radiation to intentionally cause cell death, as would be in the treatment for cancer. 
So his first referral was this elderly woman with advanced breast cancer, locally advanced breast cancer, and he uh, treated her in his basement and demonstrated shrinkage of this tumor. So if you are a medical student, you have a smart idea, you speak up. <laughs> so what is this radiation that we're using in breast cancer? It could be gamma rays, x-rays, protons, electrons, whatever it is. It has to be ionizing radiation. And what that means is that the radiation has to have enough energy to eject an electron out of an atom. And so when such energy strikes a cell, it's going to cause DNA damage in two ways. One is direct DNA strand breakage, and the other is going to be through formation of free radicals. So then there's going to be a question. I hope this question is on the upside, because then only our program is going to be the one that gets 100% right. But <laughs> so we know that chemotherapy acts on different phases of the cell cycle. But what about radiation? And my theory is, and the way I remember it at least, is if radiation is damaging DNA, if you look at the G2 phase of the cell cycle, uh, that's right after the DNA has replicated, but before the cell is divided, there's plenty of DNA around to damage. So I think G2 is the most susceptible uh, phase of the cycle. Uh, so talking about coming back to the role of radiation in breast cancer, we'll first talk about breast conservation and whole breast radiation. And the most important trial in this uh, journey has been the NSABP B06. And if Dr. Cruz were here, he'd tell you all about it. Uh, but this trial was a trial that was initiated way back in the 1970s, in 1976. And that's why we're so spoiled in the world of breast cancer, where we believe in 30-year data on large randomized control trials, because people like uh, him actually thought of doing this. Um, if you look at this trial, it had three arms. And first, comparing the two arms on the right, we looked at radiation versus no radiation after a lumpectomy, and you realized that the recurrence rates were dramatically different. You had a 40% recurrence risk if you didn't add radiation uh, to your lumpectomy. Uh, and if you did complete radiation, the recurrence risk dropped down to 14%. <clears throat> and now this gave the patients not only um, – this gave the patients an option to actually something other than a mastectomy. So now comparing with the first arm, which is the mastectomy, uh, the recurrence risks, although slightly higher, uh, were kind of comparable, and the disease-free survival and overall survival was no different. So for the first time, women now had an option uh, to have something less than a mastectomy, and that was because of radiation. The Milan trial, again, in Europe confirmed uh, similar findings that this was indeed an oncologically reasonable operation. And if you notice, their recurrence rates were even lower than ours, but that's not because they're any better surgeons. It's probably because... Their tumors were smaller, a lot more node-negative tumors. <clears throat> so the question then comes up is, does radiation improve survival? And Dr. Pistana asked me last week that, well, radiation is a local treatment, and women actually die of metastatic disease. So uh, if a patient shows up and says, well, the surgeon says he got it all, and am I really going to die if I don't get radiation? Uh, the answer is we didn't really know this until of recent when the Oxford Overview published a meta-analysis of all these randomized trials that compared radiation with no radiation, and they looked at, so in that meta-analysis, there were over 10,000 patients, and we actually did find that there was a survival advantage to radiation, which means if you prevented four lo local recurrences at 10 years, at 15 years, you saw a mortality benefit of preventing one death. So you prevent four recurrences, you prevent one death. So the theory is some, some of these microscopic foci left behind could actually be a potential for further metastases. So then does every patient with breast cancer who has a lumpectomy need radiation? Is there certain patients that avoid it? And the B21 looked at, okay, what about a tumor that's half a centimeter? Well, the truth is yes. Even if you have a tumor less than one centimeter and you're treating the patient with tamoxifen and whatever other treatment, radiation does uh, have an advantage. Now, the only subgroup where there is some uh, data to say that uh, the benefit is really questionable is was shown by the CalGB trial where they – I'm sorry, the top part got cut off – uh, women more than 70 years of age with small tumors, node negative, these were all tumors less than 2 centimeters, node negative, ER positive, were randomized to either radiation with a lumpectomy or not. And the local recurrence at 5 years was there was only a difference of 3%, which wouldn't be expected to translate to a survival advantage. Now, the gap widens when you look at their 8-year data, and that's to say that, you know, you don't necessarily have to deny radiation because the patient is older, but you can weigh the risks of competing mortalities in making that decision. So what about radiation in DCIS? Now, we know this topic is mainly covering invasive breast cancer, but uh, radiation does form an integral part of management of DCIS that's treated with a lumpectomy. So 
the NSAB PB17 again was a very big randomized control trial. And when you added radiation, you nearly half the risk of recurrence. And we know that half of DCIS recurs as invasive breast cancer, half recurs as DCIS itself. So, um, and now with the addition of tamoxifen, we proved that the local recurrence could be dropped down to 8%. So only 4% would recur uh, as invasive breast cancer. So Dr. Jatoy's theory is that nobody dies of DCIS. So let's, let's talk about an AppSite question, and we're not going to question the applicant, so you can relax. Um, this 48-year-old woman undergoes uh, a biopsy of some focal microcalcifications. The pathology shows high-grade DCIS with comedonecrosis. So which of the following is an appropriate plan of management? Lumpectomy with central node biopsy, whole breast radiation, or a mastectomy with chest wall radiation, neoadjuvant chemo, or lumpectomy with whole breast radiation and tamoxifen. So last, last slide kind of gave you the answer, which is lumpectomy, whole breast radiation, and tamoxifen is pretty reasonable. But what about A? Why is A not the right answer? What about a sentinel node biopsy in a DCIS? Well, there's really no reason to do sentinel node biopsy in a DCIS unless you have palpable DCIS or DCIS with microinvasion, and that's often mentioned in the comment section of your path report. So be careful when you read your path report that They'll talk about microinvasion, and then you would treat it like an invasive breast cancer. Or if you have multifocal DCIS and you're doing a mastectomy, you'd want to do a sentinel node at the same time, because if you have an incidental diagnosis of uh, invasive breast cancer, then you, there's no way to stage the axilla with the sentinel node once the breast is gone. So uh, then you would be committed to an axe dissection to stage the axilla. So what is this whole breast radiation like? Um, usually it involves two tangential fields op opposing each other, whereby there's no beam that's directly directed at the heart or lung, but if you notice the field of uh, overlap, the anterior lung field and the apex of the heart is kind of touched upon by that field of radiation. So it's a dose of 50 gray delivered to the breast, and they like to give an additional 10 gray boost to the tumor bed itself. So it's helpful to the radiation oncologist if you place clips in their margin, and Dr. Crownover especially told me to tell you that. Hmm. <laughs> Um, but this is what the linear accelerators that we use today look like, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what this treatment actually involves for the patient. But are there any patients that can't get radiation or in whom radiation is contraindicated? So breast cancer and pregnancy. So you really don't use radiation in any trimester of pregnancy. So then what do you do for breast cancer and pregnancy? Well, what you can do is you can still do surgery. You can, um, you know, the most conservative old board answer used to be modified radical mastectomy. But the truth is you still can do a sentinel node biopsy using the radioactive isotope because the blue dye is teratogenic. Uh, if you do a lumpectomy in the second or third trimester, you can still do your adjuvant chemo after that and delay your radiation until after surgery. Um, if the patient's in the first trimester with advanced breast cancer, you can counsel the patient about termination of pregnancy to appropriately treat the disease in time. Now, collagen vascular disease uh, is interesting because we see this a lot, and patients will say, oh, well, I have lupus. Does that mean I can't get a lumpectomy? Well, if they have skin manifestations of their lupus, and if they, they've had active uh, skin disease as part of their lupus presentations, then yes, that, then that's a contraindication. If they have scleroderma, most radiation oncologists would consider that as a contraindication. But rheumatoid arthritis in and of itself is not a contraindication. And the genetic defects like ataxia telangiectasia, Lefromini syndrome, where you have your defects in your DNA repair mechanisms, make you more susceptible to radiation-induced cancers. So if you have an aggressive cancer at hand, radiation isn't contraindicated because you're weighing the risks and benefits of treating the cancer at hand versus not. But if you have a choice between lumpectomy with radiation versus a mastectomy with potentially no radiation, then maybe you should opt for that. So we talked about, okay, almost everybody who gets a lumpectomy gets whole breast radiation. But what about patients who get a mastectomy? Do they need radiation? So we know that in most early breast cancers, we think not. But then who does need radiation after a mastectomy? So instead of telling you, I'm going to ask you again. Let's see, who volunteers? A 60-year-old has undergone mastectomy for invasive ductal carcinoma. Which of the following is the most would be a most definitive indication for radiation? And some of these are debatable, and they're kind of closed, so look carefully. But Volunteer. I'm going to pick on somebody. <laughs> That's really good. I think Dr. Pestana has passed his board multiple times. <laughs> so that is the right answer. 
Uh, and I'll tell you why these answers are kind of close. But the way I like to remember it is size 5, size 5, so 5 centimeters, and T4, and nodes 4. So four or more nodes and T4 disease, which would be skin and chest wall invasion and inflammatory breast cancer. That's all T4 disease. Size more than 5 and nodes 4 or more. And these are absolute. And there's questionable risks in the 1 to 3 node positive group. And that's being studied in ongoing trials right now. And some radiation oncologists will still treat that group of patients provided they're young and they have an aggressive presentation. So why do we radiate after a mastectomy? I mean, you're going through a whole mastectomy. Why do you need to radiate after? So in these high-risk patients, like the ones we just talked about, radiation actually drops down your risk of recurrence by a fraction of about two-thirds. And that's even when patients are being treated with systemic uh, treatments, such as tamoxifen and chemotherapy. And we know there is some effect of those drugs even on the local disease. But the benefit of radiation prevails even in patients who are getting their systemic uh, treatments. And now we know that local regional recurrence affects survival, so it's well worth doing. So what do you treat? If you're treating um, in post-mastectomy radiation, uh, what is it that's being treated? So there's no breast left, of course. So what you're treating is the chest wall, and the field's going to go all the way from the clavicle down to where the inframammary fold would have been, medially beyond the uh, midline of the sternum down to the mid-axillary line laterally. Radi all your skin flaps, mastectomy scars, drain sites, all that's going to get radiated. Um, a supraclavicular field is often added. There's a axillary boost that um, will be added if you have bulky adenopathy, if you've not had a complete dissection. There's really no role for additional radiation to the axilla if you've had a complete ax dissection. But oftentimes the radiation oncologist says, well, the, the surgeon got six nodes and the patient had like bulky lymphadenopathy, so maybe we're going to add an additional field. And then um, the internal mammary nodes, some people treat only if they're involved or if there's a suggestion that on a PET CT they're positive, and it's kind of debatable who treats them and who doesn't. So here's another upside question. So this is a 55-year-old woman who presents with her left breast completely enlarged with this large, warm mass. Then the skin, skin has this classic peau de rouge appearance. You do a full thickness biopsy, though you really don't need it because this is a clinical diagnosis. Um, and that shows tumor emboli in the dermal lymphatic. So what is the answer? It's inflammatory breast cancer. <laughs> Before Dr. Pestana answers, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> um, so this is not going to be the upside question, though. So Manny, this is your question. <laughs> there is Manny, anyway. <laughs> now, this is a talk about radiation, but I can tell you the answer is not radiation. So, I mean, for, that requires pretty obvious radiation to sorry, the neoadjuvants. So, yes. So that's right. So chemotherapy is um, the right answer. And we'll talk a little bit about the algorithm for uh, breast cancer, uh, the inflammatory breast cancer. But the point I want to make is inflammatory breast cancer is not neglected breast cancer. So there's something you want to take home from today's talk is that realize that this really can happen over that two-week cruise to Hawaii. And uh, often we blame patients for what is bad tumor biology, and as much as possible, you should try and avoid that. So if you have a patient who's presenting as inflammatory breast cancer, okay, you're going to get the port placed like in a day or two. You're going to consult your radiation oncologist, medical oncologist with a phone call. This is not something you wait for two weeks to present at tuba board. This is like the neck fast equivalent of breast cancer. But um, once, you <laughs> once you have, I'll just, um, once, you, once you've started the patient on chemo, uh, a lot of these patients will have good response to chemo, and you may actually notice that all these signs and symptoms resolve. But the surgery you're going to do is still going to be a modified radical mastectomy and nothing short of that. So it's not going to be a lumpectomy now the tumor is shrunk down. It's not going to be a sentinel node biopsy because we know that it can have a high false negative uh, rate in those. So it's still going to be a modified radical mastectomy. And let's say you do your surgery, you send your PAT specimen to the pathologist. He scans through the specimen and says, well, there's no tumor cells left behind. So that's something called pathological complete response. And if you have that, then what are you going to do? Are you still going to radiate? Well, the answer is yes, because the decision to radiate was made when the patient presented with inflammatory breast cancer. And your radiation oncologist is not going to take your word for it if he hasn't seen that for himself before. So try and get your referrals to all your consultants early when you see such a patient. 
So what is treatment like for, um, as far as radiation is concerned, from the patient standpoint? So whether it's whole breast radiation or whether it's post-mastectomy radiation, uh, you often time it about a month or so after surgery, given your incision's time to heal. If the patient's going to get chemo, it's often chemo before radiation. There's not a whole good data about that, but that's the way we like to do it. Um, now, that may change if you're doing brachytherapy, short coast radiation treatments, and you may need radiation first. But traditionally, it's been chemo first, then radiation. And you give uh, the chemo about, you know, um, you give it a month or so even after chemo because chemo is acting on rapidly dividing cells. Radiation is trying to do the same thing. So you need a good number of cells actively dividing for radiation to be effective as well. There's a, there's a simulation session that the patient goes in for. There's some intensive CT-guided planning that happens. Often some small permanent tattoos are placed so that the fields are marked out. The patient gets oriented appropriately for each treatment session. The dose is about 50 gray total, so that's, and that's more or less the same for post-mastectomy radiation or for whole breast radiation. The dose is about 50 gray. It's given in two gray fractions over 25 sessions, and that's why we talk about five days a week for five weeks, and if you add that tumor boost, it can be up to six weeks. Uh, for the left side, they often like to decrease the dose a little bit because of proximity to the heart. So instead of the two gray, they'll do a 1.8 gray, and the sessions may be over 28 days instead of 25 days. And oftentimes the patient spends about five, the treatment session itself, the radiation lasts about five to 20 minutes. So five minutes for whole breast radiation, 20 minutes for post-mastectomy radiation, and the patient ends up spending about an hour or so in the radiation center every day. So there's women who come in at seven in the morning, finish their radiation at eight, and go to work. So then you're gonna ask me, well, what about the side effects when they're getting radiation treatment? <clears throat> So as far as early side effects and systemic side effects, there's often misunderstanding. Patients think, well, I'm going to get nausea, vomiting, hair loss, and all these are actually side effects of chemo. If you think about radiation as a local treatment, your side effects are going to be local. But still at the end, like about somewhere at week three, women say, okay, well, I feel kind of run down by the end of the day. But there's really no reason to have nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, any, anything, any symptoms in the area that's not radiated. Often the most common thing that women complain about is the radiation dermatitis, which is like a sunburn. It's almost not considered a complication. It's kind of expected around the 10th session of, or so of treatment. Uh, occasionally it'll be a little worse and you can have some blistering, but that's pretty rapidly reversible and most patients in today's day and age tolerate radiation very well. There can be a, a small fraction of patients who get some pneumonitis. Late complications, the Radiated side may often feel a little more thickened and edematous compared to the normal side, to the other side. Uh, you can get this sliver of fibrosis in your anterior lung fields on a CAT scan, but that's something the patients should be aware of so they can warn you when they show up as a trauma patient and you're looking at, oh, is that pulmonary contusions? And you can sound like a really smart pit boss if you say, oh, no, the patient got whole breast radiation. That's what it is. So, but if they do have a trauma, they'll have a little higher propensity of fracturing ribs on that side. Now, Cardiac complications are certainly a concern to patients, and they often ask about it. But you don't get an MI just because you're getting radiation. But if you have additional cardiotoxic chemotherapy, which is often adromycin-based in the setting of uh, breast cancer, uh, and if you have additional risk factors, hyperlipidemia, hypercholesteremia, a few years down the line, that radiation may contribute as an additional small risk factor to develop a, developing a cardiac event. And the most important concern is radiation-induced cancers, and we heard all about it last week. Um, the incidence is low. And here, when we're treating one cancer, uh, you really it's about weighing your risks and benefits. And somewhere closer to like one in a 1,000 patients who gets breast cancer treatment uh, gets a secondary cancer. They're often sarcomas. And the incidence is a little higher, closer to like one in 800 in younger patients, because if you realize radiation DNA damage is kind of cumulative. Over the years, you acquire additional mutations, and then you develop the cancer. So if you have a longer life expectancy, your risk of cancer is a little higher than in an older patient. And these are some of the pictures which show that. So that's the classic rectangular uh, sunburn kind of an appearance that you see during radiation. That gets better quickly. The other picture shows uh, fibrosis of one side, which causes some contra contracture kind of an appearance of one breast compared to the other. And that's the CT scan finding that's expected from whole breast radiation treatment. It's a small area of the lung, and you don't really miss it. Uh, but there's certainly some problems with whole breast radiation. The majority of the patients tolerate it well. Today, be, today's day and age, radiation is really safe. Uh, but the treatment is protracted. It takes six weeks. It's quite a tight time commitment. A lot of patients don't live close to 
where the radiation facility is. They don't have the travel resources. They certainly fear, you know, the long-term systemic toxicity or toxicity to the heart, lungs. So the bottom line is that up to 30 percent of women who get a lumpectomy don't even go on to complete radiation treatment. And that's a real problem because your, your effort should be to identify these patients firsthand, like at the beginning of your uh, treatment. And you often see these patients even in the radiation clinic saying, well, you know, the doctor said he got it all, he got negative margins, I'm disease-free, why do I need radiation? So it's nice to give the radiation oncologist the opportunity to have this discussion before you've even uh, done your surgery. And then there's a fraction of women who are going to undergo a mastectomy because of fear of radiation or concerns about radiation. Um, and that, to me, is not the biggest problem because mastectomy is still a good option. It's still complete treatment. But undergoing a lumpectomy and then not undergoing radiation is a real problem. So then what are some of the alternatives? Can we make radiation for breast cancer more convenient? And over the years, it's not about making it more effective or uh, really we've gotten pretty good at making radiation effective and reaching it to where it needs to be. The question is making it more convenient for the patient. So one thing is uh, one thing that's looked at is hypofractionated radiation treatment. So if, whether you can give sh larger doses over shorter periods of time and make it more convenient that way. Uh, we're going to hear a lot about accelerated partial breast irradiation over the years, and this is uh, being already practiced a lot of places, and you'll see this. And then there's um, new and incoming data on intraoperative radiation treatment, where you can do your lumpectomy, do a single large dose of radiation, and then be done, and maybe the patient can avoid radiation altogether postoperatively. So we'll talk about some of these things as we go along. So talking first about hypofractionated re um, regimens. So the com common regimen used in the U.S. is the Canadian uh, regimen, and that's a three-week duration of treatment where you give something less than 50 gray, but you give it over 22 days. So it's the three-week treatment instead of the whole six weeks of treatment. But you have to be careful because the Canadian trial that looked at uh, comparing standard radiation versus hypofractionated radiation had very had a select group of patients. So they were mostly small tumors, ER positive tumors, mostly node negative tumors. And the tumors that were high grade, the hypofractionated uh, regimen patients actually did worse. So there is an element of patient selection, but let your radiation oncologist have this discussion. Don't promise patients anything that, oh, no, we can do this in three weeks. So. Um, it's partial breast irradiation, and this is accelerated partial breast irradiation. Accelerated because you can finish treatment in a week, and partial because you're only treating part of the breast volume. So you're treating only uh, about 50% of the volume compared to what you otherwise would have treated in whole breast irradiation. And you may ask, what is the rationale for doing that at all? Why not just radiate the whole breast? Well, we know that 80 to 90% of the tumor uh, recurrences, ipsilateral tumor recurrences, occur within the lumpectomy bed itself. And only about 4% can be definitely demonstrated to be away from where your lumpectomy uh, bed was, so in a different quadrant of the breast. And you may still say, well, why not cover that additional 4%? You're there. Well, then the argument comes in radiating a field that's outside your lumpectomy bed is as good as radiating a field you know, in the contralateral breast, because you're not trying to prevent a second breast cancer in the same breast, you're trying to prevent a recurrence. And if your rationale is to prevent a second breast cancer, you might as well radiate the contralateral breast. So this is the argument why uh, brachytherapy has evolved. It's, it's a more convenient, it's more convenient to the patient if you can prove that it's just as good. And so we'll talk about the different modalities. Now, I don't want you to confuse brachytherapy with partial breast irradiation. Brachytherapy is a subset of partial breast irradiation. You can still radiate part of the breast using your external beam equipment, and that's called, that's done with use of uh, 3D conformational re, uh, imaging that's used for pl uh, planning those treatments, and we'll talk about that too. And then brachytherapy is where the, the radiation div is delivered inside out, so either via catheters or interstitial catheters, balloon catheters, or intraoperative radiation, that would all qualify as being a brachytherapy treatment. So this was the oldest form of brachytherapy that was started and studied, and um, this is the multi-catheter multi interstitial brachytherapy treatment. It looks really barbaric, but I'm told that women tolerated it pretty well. I can tell you I wouldn't want it. But, um, so there's multiple, about 20 catheters or so that are placed around the lumpectomy <laughs> bed, uh, trying to deliver radiation to an area of about a centimeter or two into the lumpectomy bed. and uh, these catheters get placed, and the patient leaves uh, some look, look uh, the operating room look, looking something like 
with the picture on the left. And then when she comes to the radiation center, those catheters get connected to a high-dose radiation source. Treatments are done twice a day for a week, and the end of the week they get the catheters out. The balloon catheter brachytherapy, and this is currently the most popular way of doing brachytherapy in the U.S. Like there was a recent presentation that said 15% of Medicare patients with breast cancer are being treated with this uh, form of brachytherapy, and you may have heard of mamocyte and contura and these balloon catheters. And um, what these catheters are is essentially, um, they're multi-lumen catheters, and on the tip of which there is a balloon that then conforms to your lumpectomy bed. You need a good distance of at least a half a centimeter between the skin and your lumpectomy bed so that you don't radiate the uh, skin and have complications of necrosis from that. You kind of want to preserve your lumpectomy seroma cavity, so don't obliterate your seroma cavity if you plan to pursue one of these treatments. And at the time of your lumpectomy, you can either place the device or you can place a spacer device so that you can wait for your path, and then under local, you can exchange it out for the real catheter when your final com path comes back in two weeks or so. Once the catheter is placed, you can place this like on a Thursday. The patient has their radiation planning, CT guide, which is CT guided on like a Friday, get, gets their treatment through the next week, Monday through Friday, and then the next Friday you can take uh, the catheter out. So a lot, a lot of women consider this convenient in terms of time commitment, but you still have a balloon sticking out of your breast for a week. Um, the American Society of Breast Surgeons has a registry, and they're studying this treatment. Uh, they have some five-year data that shows recurrence risk of somewhere like closer to uh, 6%, and they think the toxicity is comparable to whole breast radiation. But the treatment, the follow-up we have is certainly not like the follow-up we have for whole breast irradiation. But what happened is a lot of these treatments started to get uh, used in practice because the FDA approved the device, and they, they were being used even before, you know, all these big um, associations, the American Society of Breast Surgeons, the American Society of Radiation Oncologists had any say about it. So they felt compelled to make certain guidelines about who can and who can't get these treatments, and we'll talk about those a little bit. And this is another similar device, which instead of the balloon has um, – these struts that are multi-lumen, and that again conforms to uh, the cavity. And then this is the partial breast irradiation by external beam method. So you, you have several beams converging onto the target, and they're coming from different directions in smaller doses, but the cumulative dose is what you want it to be. But when it passes through adjacent tissues, the adjacent tissues don't get as much radiation. So that's called 3D CRT. Another even more sophisticated treatment is IMRT. And this was something, you know, when we interviewed for our breast fellowship, there were the candidates were asking the centers, oh, do you do IMRT? And, you know, this was, this was one of the cool things to do. So um, if you think of every radiation beam made, being made of several beamlets, you, can, you now have the capability of adjusting the dose in each of these little beamlets. So if you're coming close to the heart, if you're coming close to some area you don't want to radiate, you can actually drop the dose within that area of the beam itself. And so this is, most people think it's overkill for breast radiation, but it's still when you're uh, trying to protect important areas, it's useful. So these are the guidelines that I was talking about. And every society that thinks that they have some authority to talk about breast surgery makes their own guidelines and puts them up there because you don't have a whole amount of data to say what is okay and what is not okay to treat with partial breast irradiation. And uh, the ASTRO, which is one of the important organizations, says, okay, maybe it's okay to do it in somebody who's more than 60, has invasive ductals, so not invasive lobular, not DCIS, um, less than two centimeters, has a good margin. You have, you have no positive margins. You're node negative. You may be able to try it. Uh, but the B39, the NSABP B39 is an ongoing trial, and we were one of the centers, uh, we are one of the centers for, in this trial looking at the external beam partial breast irradiation. Uh, treatments. And this trial over the years will give us more information as to um, who would be suitable for re, um, partial breast irradiation. And the column on the extreme right shows their inclusion criteria. So they're definitely studying a broader group of patients. So intraoperative radiation treatment. And this is kind of exciting because, you know, if you can say that the woman can just get intraoperative radiation and be done, um, it, it would be great. So uh, what this equipment looks like, and I've, I'm only discussing one of the two modalities of doing this intraoperative radiation. This is um, the intrabeam equipment. It looks like a C-arm, and at the tip of that instrument, you uh, load on one of these uh, conical cylinders, which 
has a sphere at the end. The sphere conforms to your lumpectomy cavity. Uh, once you're done with your resection, you sort of place that sphere into it, give it 20, 30 minutes, and then you're done. You close up the wound just as usual, and the patient goes home. And this was initially studied just to deliver the additional tumor boost, but uh, there was recently a, a trial called the Target A that was a non-inferiority trial, and as I said, everything in breast radiation is going to proving non-inferiority and more convenience for the patient. So this trial actually randomized over 2,000 patients um, to getting either whole breast radiation or intraoperative radiation treatment. And their follow-up was still about not even two years so far, but the projected uh, five-year recurrence rates were in the whole breast radiation group were 0.9, and uh, the target group was 1.2, which is not a whole lot of difference, not a statistically significant difference, and the toxicity and complications reported were similar. So this trial was aiming to show that intraoperative radiation is not inferior, and uh, came to doing that, although the follow-up was uh, is pretty short at this point. So the equipment, like I talked about, they used um, the form of radiation they used is uh, X-rays. The dose was 20 gray at the tumor bed, and a lot of people argue that at about a centimeter X-rays, the dose decrements to about five gray at the centimeter out into the tumor bed. It takes about 20, 30 minutes of additional operating room time. The equipment itself costs $400,000. But uh, if you think about our modern linear accelerators, they cost somewhere close to $2 million. So most people think that if you can do this and prevent the patient from having to come back for six weeks, it would still be cost effective. And then um, one thing is that this was, again, the group that they randomized to intraoperative radiation, 15% of the patients got additional whole breast radiation for discovery of unexpected factors on the pathology. So if they had invasive lobular, extensive introductal component, or if you had any other adverse Factor. And this was left to the individual centers. So you could have, if you had lymphovascular invasion, high-grade tumors, some centers chose to add whole breast radiation, and that came out to being a 15% of the patients. So you have to look at this data with some caution. I think we need longer follow-up. So coming to radiation and reconstruction, and of course that this pertains to the mastectomy group of patients. From the oncologic standpoint, okay, we get it that radiation is important. What about from the cosmetic and reconstruction standpoint? So there are cer certainly some complications and concerns associated with radiation. So you don't really plan to reconstruct somebody and then radiate the heck out of your flaps and implants. And there, here's the reason why. Because let's say you did a skin-sparing mastectomy and you placed an immediate um, implant, you, you have a higher risk of capsular contracture, fibrosis, poor cosmesis. You did a flap, radiate the flap, there is a higher incidence of flap necrosis, wound breakdown, and those sort of complications. Let's say you say, I'm going to uh, wait on it, so I'm going to finish radiation and then stick an implant in there or a tissue expander in there. That's hard to do because radiated skin is very unforgiving. It's hard to expand radiated skin. And the other concerns are once you have a reconstructed breast and you have that altered contour, is your radiation even getting to where you want it? Uh, to reach. So the dose delivery around the reconstructed breast becomes an additional concern. So what may be some of the solutions to that? And a lot of different centers do things very differently. One is, well, if a patient is a candidate for a flap reconstruction, just do a delayed flap reconstruction. That's okay. So finish your radiation treatment and do a delayed tram or deep flap or whatever it may be. But not every patient is a candidate for a flap. So one of the things that they do at MD Anderson is something they call delayed immediate reconstruction. I thought it was confusing in the beginning, but what they do is you do a skin sparing mastectomy, place a tissue expander in there. Then you wait for your final path. If your final path says you don't need radiation, you can take the expander out and place either a permanent implant or do an autologous flap under that nice preserved skin envelope that you have. Let's say you do need radiation. What they do is they still continue the expansion and keep the expander inflated through the chemo, and if for the duration of radiation, they deflate that expander, because if you realize the expanders, you still have the ability to inflate and deflate them as needed. And so you deflate them for the radiation, you reinflate them at the end of radiation, so you have that preserved skin envelope, because if you're going to do a skin sparing mastectomy and you're preserving the skin envelope, you have to place something under there, otherwise it's going to stick down to your chest wall and it's not going to be of any use. Um, and then they go ahead and do a delayed reconstruction if the patient expects, is expected to get radiation. At Sloan Kettering, because they always do everything diametrically opposite to MD Anderson, they radiate the implant. And um, they, do, they place an expander, they expand it, 
and then they exchange the expander out for an implant and then radiate their final implant. Now, that d does add additional time because now you have to wait from the time you exchange your implant to actually start your radiation treatment. Uh, but that's the way uh, Sloan Kettering does it, and recently they presented their data at San Antonio a few weeks ago. The San Antonio Breast Symposium for the applicants is one of the largest breast cancer symposiums, and that's always in San Antonio every year. It's a well, very well-attended meeting. Uh, but they presented their data, and they said that, you know, 90% of the times they can preserve their implants doing it this way, um, and about 70% of their patients are pretty happy with the end result anyway. So you don't necessarily have to deny patients the option of having a radi having reconstruction just because they're getting, uh, getting radiation. And then you can use these techniques like IMRT to work around that contour of the reconstructed breast if you're concerned about your radiation reaching where it needs to. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about radiation and local regional recurrence. And I put these slides up there just to stress the fact that oftentimes women undergo a mastectomy thinking, well, if I have a mastectomy, I'm not going to have a recurrence. Well, that's not true. You do still have, uh, you know, somewhere close to the 10% risk of recurrence that we saw on the B6. It's much lower now with the modern chemotherapy, tamoxifen, and all these drugs. But you still do have a risk, real risk of recurrence even after a mastectomy. And the first picture shows a recurrence in the setting of um, you know, a standard traditional uh, mastectomy. And the second is this patient who's had a tram flap and has a uh, recurrence up there, as you can see. So for local regional recurrence, if you've had pretty good systemic control of the disease, and if you think this is the only thing that's left behind now, you have pretty good control on their uh, overall disease, uh, you can attempt a wide local excision, and then you can use radiation if provided they haven't been radiated in the same field before. So there's another area you can use radiation. And then coming to radiation and metastatic disease. Uh, and this is important because, you know, this is what women die of. This is what they're going to suffer from. So the first picture shows a brain mat. And if you have a solitary brain mat in the setting of breast cancer and you have good otherwise systemic and local control of the disease, you can attempt a curative resection for this. So you can resect the mat and do whole brain irradiation. Uh, but that's for a solitary uh, met, and there's not a whole rate. You usually wouldn't do it for uh, multiple mets. Then there's bone mets, and we know that women with isolated bone metastases in breast cancer actually have pretty good uh, survival. So you can survive for a very long time in the setting of bone metastases, and so it's important to palliate these uh, patients for the symptoms as they arise. So if they have back pain, bone pain, radiation can be used to alleviate that. And the third picture is actually metastases to the choroid, and I've never seen that, but apparently that can be uh, radiated too. But I do want to take a moment to talk about brain metastases because um, we're seeing this a lot more now that we have such good treatments for overall systemic control of the disease. You have these drugs like Herceptin that don't really cross the blood-brain barrier, and these are the patients that are at risk of brain metastases. So it's kind of a similar picture to what Sidney Farber saw when he was treating kids with leukemia that you had pretty good systemic response and then these kids died of uh, CNS disease. Um, so we don't have a very good handle on how to prevent these uh, brain metastases, but there's increasing interest in how to treat these and how to palliate these. One of the things you would hear about is stereotactic radiosurgery, and I can tell you, you hear these terms gamma knife, cyber knife, there is no knife involved. So. <laughs> So it's really a stereotactic frame that's placed around the patient's head in the radiation center to immobilize the head, get some coordinates. And then you deliver a single large dose of radiation targeting exactly the area that you want to target and avoid the surrounding important areas like the optic chiasma, the you know, speech areas, and those sort of things. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of success demonstrated with these techniques, although the survival for these patients in general is very poor. So and the document survival is like two, three months of an improvement. So it's still, it's still dismal. But this, these are some of the results. So uh, if you look at the first top left slide, you look at that metastasis, and there's a lot of element of this vasogenic edema, all that hypoechoic, uh, hypo intense area around that lesion. And if you look at after radiosurgery, that re that's quite receded, and the uh, other met on the right side has nearly regressed. So radiation can be used in uh, metastatic disease as well. So we've talked about uh, different aspects of radiation. We've talked a little bit about the background. We've talked a little bit about 
whole rest of radiation in a setting of lumpectomy, who gets post-mastectomy radiation, something about inflammatory breast cancer, a little bit about DCIS. Um, and then uh, emerging techniques in brachytherapy, intraoperative radiotherapy, and the role for radiation in local regional recurrence and metastatic disease. Some of the take-home points you may want to know is, you may want to uh, take is going to be, you know, identify the patients who you think are going to need radiation and counsel them early on if you can about um, the anticipated treatment so that they're not overwhelmed after, you're do after you've done your surgery that, oh, now I need radiation. That's not a surprise. Stay friends with your radiation oncologist. Uh, refer early. And um, when you're in doubt, and if the patient's making a decision about your surgery based on what the radiation oncologist is going to do, let them talk about their side effects. Let them talk about what radiation entails. Place clips on the lumpectomy bed. Um, and then protect your plastic surgeons. Warn them, too, that if you expect radiation, so if you're referring to a plastic surgeon, tell them what the probabilities of you needing radiation are, and they may alter their radiation, their reconstruction plan accordingly. And then there's going to be a lot more to come in accelerated partial breast irradiation and intraoperative radiation therapy, so stay tuned for more. So I hope that was not a whole lot of new and confusing terminology, <laughs> and I hope you're not too overwhelmed. So with that, I want to thank you all for listening. Roger, that was great. I have uh, one comment and one question. Uh, the comment is, I hope all the residents and all the future surgeons in the audience were listening because this stuff is important. And this is the only topic guaranteed to be on your oral boards, okay? There's sections on vascular or trauma, and you might get one or the other. There's sections on lower GI, and you might get diverticular disease or colon cancer or something. But there's a section on breast, breast disease, 100% guarantee there will be a breast question on your oral board. So even if you don't plan to practice breast surgery, if you want to be a board-certified surgeon, you need to know about breast surgery. Um, the question is, uh, as a knuckle-dragging trauma surgeon who doesn't do much breast surgery and only sees breast abscesses, um, the radiation within the uh, lumpectomy site, preserve the seroma, then radiate the tissue and necros it, and go into it a couple of times over a multi-week period. Sounds like if you're writing a recipe for how to create a breast abscess, that would be the recipe. Uh, but then there was no mention of uh, infectious complications of this. Are, are there none, or do they just don't mention them, or what? Uh, so actually the most um, debilitating complication of that procedure itself is described as a seroma. And these are not the regular seromas that you have after the surgery. These are very uh, symptomatic seromas, where the if you, know, if you realize you get a balloon, then you compress the heck out of the tissue around it and keep it there for a, few, for a week or so, and then you radiate. So that becomes a very fibrotic and chronic seroma that's going to persist uh, over years. Now, there hasn't been described an increased incidence of wound infection uh, from this, but um, like I said, this, this data is early, but there hasn't been uh, increased infection. Right. Right. Other questions for Dr. Gedio? Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I thought that was a great talk. I think you did a very, very good job summarizing what's really a very, very broad topic. But, you know, people always like to sort of quantitate uh, what the effect of radiation is. And I think it's just important to so I'll just make a comment. So, you know, we've had two big overviews, you know, the two Oxford overviews, the 2005 Oxford overview, and there was an Oxford overview published last month in The Lancet. So two broad overviews with, uh, you know, with, with thousands of patients. And what becomes evident is that if you give radiation, the high-risk patients, high-risk subsets of patients, you reduce the risk of recurrence by half. Okay, so you so you re, you reduce the risk of recurrence by about 30 percent down to about 15 percent with radiotherapy. And on the downstream end, you cut the risk of death by a sixth. So you go from about a 25 percent risk of death down to about a 21 percent risk of death. So there are two implications of this thing. One is, remember, in all these trials, it was surgery, chemotherapy followed by radiation. What this implies is that radiation works in areas where surgery and chemotherapy don't work. So where surgery can't reach and where chemotherapy is ineffective. So there's a, there's, a, there's a huge benefit of radiation above and beyond surgery and chemotherapy. And the other thing I think to, to, to sort of, you know, when you look at the Oxford overviews, 
if, if, there's a, if, there's a, if there's a 50 percent reduction in risk of occurrence, why isn't there a concomitant similar reduction in risk of mortality? I think what that implies is that there's micrometastatic disease. And there's, there's a subset of patients where you've got localized disease, lethal localized disease, that could translate to mortality decrement down the line. But the majority of the patients, there's, there, there's also systemic disease. Third point I'll bring out is that radiotherapy seems to have a uh, uh, preference and benefit for patients with ER positive disease. So, you know, ER negative disease is very hard to treat. And what we're finding now in the Oscar review came out last month is that when we talk about a 50% reduction in risk of recurrence, the majority of that benefit goes to ER positive patients. The ER negative patients benefit very little from radiotherapy. So we're finding that the ER negative subset is very resistant not only to drug treatments, but also to local therapy. So I think those are just kind of points to bring up. I thought it was an excellent Thank overview. You. That was a nice shot, Pranjali. Um, the question I had is, you mentioned you need, tr if you can prevent four recurrences, you're saving one life. How many patients um, do you need to treat with radiation to prevent recurrences? Do you have an idea? So if we assume that you have, you know, you're going to drop your risk of recurrence by 50 percent. So you, to, so if it's, you, I guess you would be like eight patients to drop it down to four, per, like four, and then for that one. Yeah, so, so the, the, uh, the, absolute, the, the, the number needed to treat is one divided by the absolute benefit. Okay, so the absolute benefit is 15 percent. It's one divided by 15 percent. So you treat 15 patients to present one risk of recurrence. Any other questions for Dr. Gagyo? All right, Pranjali, thank you very much.